Yes, good evening everybody. Um, thank you for coming tonight. My name is Clay Eels. I've long been uh, affiliated with the Southwest Seattle Historical Society, and many of you know a lot of the things that we've done over the years. And I'm West Seattle through and through, but tonight I, my capacity in introducing this program to you is that I'm the editor of the book that you're about to hear about, and I was also fortunate to write the introduction to it, and I've been attached to, by the hip to these guys for several months here, actually close to a year, and, uh, Thank you very much. and it, got is, arthritis now. <laughs> it is my honor to have been a part of this project, which took, um, well, in one sense you could say it took a couple of years, but in another sense you could say it took 37 years, and you're going to hear all about this tonight. Before we introduce these two guys, there's another West Seattleite you ought to know is in the audience, and that is our former mayor, Greg Nichols, right here. Give him a hand. Stand up, Greg. Stand up. And I would like to, you to give a loud uh, ringing applause for our two guests tonight, the authors of Seattle Now and Then, The Historic Hundred, Paul Dorpat and Jean Sherrard. A good resounding applause for Sharon, the, his honor's wife. All right? <laughs> she, uh, she is really worth it uh, and uh, responsible for many good things. Okay. All right. Well, let's see. I'll choose one mic and then Paul and I will move back and forth. Well, Paul has been doing this column. Oops. I lose, we lost it. Let's try this one. There we go. Paul has been doing this column since January 17th, 1982. So, uh, as of last week, it just turned 37 years old. And in total, that's well over 1,800 columns. Uh, most of those have been waiting for... Uh, uh, digital copying and uh, and production in Paul's uh, basement drawers, and they will be uh, accessible on our website pauldorpat.com. Uh, until this year, we uh, there was no way that you could look through all of these columns, but they are we're slowly putting them up on our blog. So, if you have any interest in following from the beginning to today, keep. Keep your eyes open and go to pauldorpat.com and you'll see links to that. Uh, at this point, uh, the uh, well, we're going to start as we have. I think this is our 25th program, the second one after it's Christmas. The, it's the 20. Yes, you're right, 25th. 25. Absolutely. And uh, so we we are now in the quarter at the quarter century mark. Uh, Let's, uh, we're going to start now with a short biography of Paul, who turned 80 last October 28th. Uh, he's been omitting this a lot, usually, so you, somehow he's, uh, he's uh, figured out that you want this somehow. I don't, I don't understand why you should want to see a short biography of me, but I'll accept it. <laughs> so, here's the, our little open, and you may... These are the joys of Photoshop. I can do anything I want. <laughs> well, here we are. Well, you know, that was intentional. We'll talk about this later. I didn't want it to look like it was actually. So here we are. Paul is in North Dakota uh, as, a, uh, as a young lad in, in the war years. And this photo he has called Saving the World for Democracy. <laughs> this is World War II in the backyard of the Reverend... Uh, Dorpat and Cherry, his wife, Parsonage on Reeves Drive in Grand Forks, North Dakota, probably 1942, maybe. Yeah. 42. How old is this kid? I think he's four years old, maybe five. All right, that'd be about 42. Uh, the um, Allied forces are. 
taking control, you know, or it looks pretty promising. Very good. That's why I'm right there at the lead. Right. I think at this point, William Shirer described Berlin as a rotten apple, rotting from within. Well, let's go forward, or actually backwards, to probably... I just read it. We're going back to about uh, within the first year of Paul's birth, which was in, in on October 28, 1938, and there's Paul, the baby of the family, and his eldest brother, Ted, and his two other brothers. The one is, is all known in the family as the handsome one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. He was the best looking one. They're all gone now except me. Everybody in the family is kaput. But, uh, and I plan to be around for at least another four months. <laughs> so in our first then and now, we will see the brothers in a photograph that I took about 15 years ago. And they're still the handsome one, and he has the glass of wine. Yes. <laughs> handsome and, and a connoisseur as well. Yeah, he's a decent guy, a decent guy. Good sense of humor. Very nice guy. All of them are okay. There's mom on the far right, and dad next to her. Are we seeing too much of this, I'm wondering? Not yet. Okay. Go ahead. Oops. Oops. We'll jump forward now to 19, mid, late 1960s, the Seattle's first underground newspaper, The Helix, which uh, as a kid, I remember in 1968, uh, and it was a it was the helix with which I would I would cut out the back covers and and offend my mother, which was a great use for a ten year old. I liked his mother a lot. Really, a very effective person. She started the, with uh, Jean's dad, the Northwest, well, the Hillside, the Northwest Hillside School. Hillside School. And uh, Dean's dad uh, recently died just three days ago, so he's in mourning right now. Today. It was a good death, though. And my nephew is here too. So he came to, uh, from New York. Flew right? from New York, so he decided to come tonight. Well, the Helix went on and became a sort of a uh, a stepping stone for things like uh, uh, rock festivals, and this was uh, this was kind of a marvel. Uh, Paul, where are we? What are we looking at here? We're well, looking at the uh, lineup for the bands that would be playing at the first of three Sky Rivers. This was in 68. And that was at the end of the summer. And I'm sure many of you were there, right? <laughs> Raise your hands if you were there. There's one. We have, a, we have one Sky River attendee. Really? Who is it? Raise your hand. I remember the Helix. What's that? So I remember the Do you need a hat? Do you need a hat? Okay. I was going to give you a hat in a word, but uh, I can save it for somebody else. We'll have plenty of chances to give a hat away tonight. Okay? Well, here we are at that same Sky River Festival, and Paul's standing with uh, Tom. Tom? Robbins. Do you, any of you know who Tom Robbins is? Yeah, he's a novelist, yeah. So there we are at the first Sky River, amazed at the rain, which fell the, for an, almost the entire time. But what thing Tom said to me the last time I talked to him, he said, you know what was unique about that place at that time was that we all felt so happy. And that's true, we all really felt happy as a group. It was wonderful, wonderful experience. Well, to, to look a little bit deeper into this, into this feeling of happiness, Maybe you might you may remember, recall the following photo, and we always ask if were you in this picture? <laughs> that's this, the same place, though. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. It's yeah. the same place, but that's when the sun came out. This is <laughs> when the sun came out, and I think it was. Didn't you nickname it Mud River? I didn't, but that's a good name. Huh. Yeah, Mud River is a good name. <laughs> No, you could. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to jump forward now in time to when Paul adopted his role as our our historian without portfolio. Oh, one of them. Uh, and by the way, our our former uh, mayor is handling something, carrying something with him today. You want to hold it up? Look at that. 
Uh, it's upside down. Yeah. Isn't that nice? Okay, thanks for showing up with that. You didn't know this was coming. Did we plan this? No, no sir. No, we didn't. I, that's good. Good and honest. In fact, the two of them have never met before. <laughs> Well, Paul did this 294 glimpses in, in the year before he actually started the column, and he sold these 294 glimpses cleverly at a penny a glimpse. And I think says he sold about 40,000 copies. Now, I think that, you notice, always he says that he sold, he says, about 40,000. He doesn't believe me. You can see that? But it's true. We had three different printings. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so forward we go, and here we are early on in the 80s. Paul is, is uh, this is a wonderful photo with the great Murray Morgan. How many of you know who Murray Morgan is? One, one person. Well, Murray Morgan wrote, how does that happen? How can only one person, oh, in this era, learned crowd, only one person knows who Murray Morgan is? You may be familiar with his book, which has never gone out of print, and has just received a, a new printing, Skid Road. Isn't, there a, isn't tomorrow night a... It is. Yeah, there's a celebration of Murray. Are you going to go to it? I don't think I can. It's, it's next Wednesday night, down at Folio. Oh, okay. Thank God for that. Okay. We can make that next Wednesday. Very good. I'll uh, find a driver. Very good. Paul also became a, uh, an interviewer of uh, people who had memories of significant events in the past. This is Lucy Campbell Coe, who as a young girl witnessed the Seattle fire. Yeah, she was a, a fine, fine person. Had a lot of good visits with her. Her family was uh, very much involved with the Children's Orthopedic Hospital. Her husband and her husband's husband her husband's dad and her husband's dad's dad were all involved with the creation of that hospital for kids. He was a good, good person. We'll jump forward now. Paul and I began working together on the book Washington Then and Now uh, in about 2004. And over a period of maybe two and a half years, uh, we drove the state uh, and collected... Uh, many hundreds of, of comparisons, and that book came out in 2007. In 2011, uh, we joined with our friend Berenger Lamont, a uh, French photographer, and put on a show at the last incarnation of Mohai, before its current, uh, when it was in the old location where 520 is today, and it was just called Now and Then. And in the foyer, there were uh, Now and Thens from Paris, and in the sprinkled throughout the large room Beyond, we filled it up with photos of the state and of the city. And Berenger actually took this photo of the two of us standing in the lobby out front. Here she is. Uh, this is about 2011. And what I'm going to show you now is our own a little, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a, a view of Paul that, that has, uh, comes in from, a, from an unexpected direction and uh, I'm just gonna I'm gonna go ahead and play it. You might hear the video through my computer, but uh, know that when the camera begins to shake, it's because I'm laughing. This is a visit we made to Berenger in 2005, and uh, we somehow got it on video. And I uh, we'll just. Oh, that's incredible. He looks very much like me, doesn't he? He does. With right. the glasses, with the glasses. <laughs> take, the, take this video. Okay. So at this point, Berenger says, you've got to go back, and I, I need to take a, a, an actual photo with my good camera. So there's Berenger, and Paul sits back down, and here's where I just about lose it. Mm -hmm. 
Here's Berenger's picture of the two of them side by side. How often do you actually find your doppelganger? In Paris, in Paris, at a, at a uh, restaurant in Paris, not often. Anywhere, I've never found someone who resembles me quite that much, and even the glasses are similar in, in his, his choice of hat. I, I, where, wherever, well, it turns out that this fellow was a... Romanian Orthodox priest, and here he is several years later, Berenger tracked him down, and, and here he is in his, in his church, where he had just received an, a, an award for lovely restoration, uh, and was, was also found the, 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 uh, the image of Paul to be quite uh, wonderful, and enjoyed it a lot. Amusing, I Amusing. Not wonderful. Amusing, yeah. Okay. All right, so let's get straight into the book now. And this is the very first column from January 17th, 1982. It is the return of the 63rd Coastal Artillery in 1919 from the First World War. And Paul, uh, it's on the corner of Fourth and Pike. And my job in repeating the, the photos in the book, and particularly the hundred or so that we chose to, to represent the column, uh, my, my job, self-assigned, was to find unique expressions of our current city which would in some way match or, or uh, uh, complement the, the old expression. And in this case, I went back to that corner on January 21st, 1917, for the largest march in Seattle history, which was the Women's March. Uh, one century later. One century later. 2017. 2017. Did I say 1917? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good color in 1917. Also on the corner of Fourth and Pike. Thanks for catching that, Clay. <laughs> well, that's the role of the editor. Here's the original photo that Paul shot at, uh, near that same corner. Uh, and note the barista as he's figuring the, the method by which he's going to uh, identify photo and then and now. He has the barista cleverly holding the original photo. For she wondered whether she should stand on it, but uh, no, I said hold it. <laughs> Here it appears in the book, and so you're looking at the very first comparison in the book, and we followed uh, arbitrarily, We but uh, w the structure we chose was to follow the progression of Paul's columns. So the very first uh, comparison in the book is from uh, the first of Paul's columns that appeared in the Times. The final comparison is the uh, the column that appeared actually last summer. So we we consecutively follow Paul's columns, not chronologically, but as Paul's columns appeared. How many columns have there been in the thirty? How many years? It's 37. 37 years. How many? Well, years? we calculated more than 1,800. My goodness, really? Yeah. No wonder I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good. <clears throat> well, this is a portrait of, uh, from 1880, January, uh, mid-January, of uh, Seattle's deepest snow. This, uh, in about eight days, starting on January 4th, 64 inches fell in downtown Seattle. This is the corner of First and Cherry. Uh, the, uh, the state's governor, Elisha Ferry, had just written uh, uh, the State of the Union address a, a, a little bit earlier, but it was published that Sunday in The Intelligencer. And in the paper he said, Seattle is noted for its clement weather and its lack of harsh conditions. And a day later, the snow began to fall and it fell for eight days and 64 inches. And 
Paul, will you tell us about the structures? Oh, certainly, yeah, that's uh, Yesler's Pavilion at that corner, which would be the southeast corner of Cherry and First, or Front as it was called then. And the house behind it on Second Avenue was the mayor's, no, the, the sheriff's house. And then the church up there on Fourth is the Baptist Church, First Baptist, which was uh, destroyed with the regrade of Fourth Avenue in 1907. And uh, we can tell you a whole lot of regrade stories, so we just pause and do that. Well, we could just pause for regrade stories, yeah. but first let me tell you that this gave this picture actually gave me some trouble because we haven't had many deep snows in the last couple of years. I started reshooting. It's heroic what he did. It, Wait till you see it. I worked so hard. I went down early one morning and I captured snow falling at that same spot. <laughs> now I want to I'm I'm thank you. For, thank you. Now I, I in my defense I want to point out the stack on top of the look. There's at least two inches on there. This was a heavy snow. It actually layered the streets at about six. I got down about seven, and this is what I found. So I just missed everything, but and a little bit on the cars. But this is this is about the most snow I could find since we started planning for publication. Not 64 inches, but as close as we could get. Down on the waterfront, this is a picture taken by uh, the photographer who. In the, in the 90s, lived in Seattle, the Norwegian photographer, Anders Vilse. And Vilse uh, was, uh, uh, for several years, took a, a, a number of remarkable images of, of our fair city. And uh, before, uh, his wife summoned him back to Norway. Well, actually, she, she was here with him, and then she went back a little early, and he was following, so... When he got there, back there with her, she announced to him then, I'm not going back to Seattle. You're staying here or that's it. So that was the end of Seattle and, uh, and we'll see. He stayed with his wife, who was a good husband. And uh, then what, what became of him? Well, I'll get to, I'll get to him in, in a couple more slides, but let's just take, here he is standing on the waterfront in the late uh, 1890s looking uh, south. Uh, and uh, with his bike, his back towards Pike. And today, if we go to pretty close to that same spot, we we not only lost Vilsa, but we're about, of course, to lose the viaduct. It's it's coming down. And uh, these are my kids from Hillside School. I take them down on little historical excursions uh, where I teach theater. And occasionally, I'll take them down to the market or downtown or to Mohai, and, and we'll explore. They love the waterfront, and here they are, quite literally, dancing at the fountain. Don't we have a Hillside student here tonight? Well, my nephew went to Hillside. Where is he? He's back here somewhere. Oh. There, there he is. is. <laughs> he was himself a performer. Uh, he is a performer. So, another Vilsa looking north on the waterfront. Uh, this is right about the height of the gold rush. You can see this kind of lovely sign, which I'll read to you. Portable aluminum houses weight 150 pounds. So you can imagine, as in Chaplin's Gold Rush, that line of men climbing the hill, a number of them bearing these 150-pound aluminum houses on their backs. And in, this, in about a six-month period, around this time, more than 100 ships left the waterfront for the Yukon. It was a fever. And here we are today. Now, this is also a, an illustration of just how quickly uh, this whole area has changed in that all these parking spaces, if you've been down on the waterfront recently, Alaskan Way has changed. Uh, there are, there's no more parking down there. Uh, it's now a street and a, and a relatively busy one. So uh, the... Uh, the Marion Street pedestrian overpass is still there, but the, uh, the structure is already altering, and very soon we will see the, the viaduct itself removed. When is it going to be removed? Over the next six months is, the, is removal, and the Waterfront Merchants Association is, is hoping and praying that it will all be done 
uh, before the summer really, really kicks into gear. So, Clay, did you know that that was happening that quick? Sure. Clay was a great promoter of uh, of the viaduct. He uh, was sorely injured by its destruction. Well, I think we've heard a lot from West Seattleites and, and, and folks in Ballard that uh, there's a sense of grief at the loss of the viaduct, if only because, forget about the views, you guys just added 30 minutes to your commute. Yeah. Oh. It's, it's, it's right, tough. I want to make sure that that's true. Is it 30 minutes? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, it depends on where you're going. <laughs> but you can't get off downtown now. We have we have another expert on this in the audience. You could call on. <laughs> you mean the mayor? Let's see how he feels about it. It will be a tough couple of weeks, and it'll be followed by a wonderful new waterfront. There you go. There you go. So we just bring washing a little bit. My dad built the worked on on the viaduct. What's that? My dad worked on the viaduct, so I. Uh, you're sentimental about it. Yeah. yeah that's, that's okay. <laughs> well, here we are. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll mention now that uh, Andres Vilsa went back to Norway to join his wife and spent the next several decades uh, becoming uh, uh, the, sort of the Norwegian equivalent of uh, Ansel Adams. And he wandered around and took portraits of village life and city life and, and nature. And, and they, in 2015, they were... Uh, uh, created a whole series of stamps uh, with Vilsa's image on them. And he really honed his chops in Seattle. So, very good, very good. Where are we going now, Gene? Oh, we're going to the top of the Smith Tower. Oh, boy. <coughs> it's a thrill, it's a thrill. What are some of those, uh, what's that big scar there in the upper right? Oh, this one here? Yeah. Well, you tell us, what is the scar? Well, well, that's from the Rainier Hotel that was built after the fire of 1889 as a quick way to put up lodgings for people coming to rebuild the city. And uh, it was all wood, it was huge, but it, was, it ran out of its use in about 10 years um, because they rebuilt the city so quickly and so lavishly that they had plenty of room, even though it was a boom time. They were building everywhere, not simply in Seattle too, but primarily in Seattle. It was really the boom town following its big fire of 1889. So what we're looking down now from is the Smith Tower near the observation deck, but we're looking down through the eyes of a photographer because in, in 2000, I'm doing it again, in 1913, it, we were still a year away from opening to the general public. So this photographer climbed up, went up the elevator, and shot through the open spaces to look over the city. And for the first time from 2nd and Yesler, you could see Queen Anne Hill. And there's Queen Anne High School. There's Lake, Lake Union. And there's Lake Union there. And there's uh, St. James. And here's the Methodist Dome. And here's the Rainier Club. We're going to go... We're going to go to our modern view, and I want you to keep focused, just to let your eyes wander between Queen Anne and Lake Union and the Rainier Club. Let's look at it today. Let's see. <laughs> well, we still have the Rainier Club. How about, uh, how about us all being psychoanalysts? and trying to figure out what actually is amusing about that difference. Because you all laughed. Why do we laugh at such things? I don't have the answer for it, but I think Clay does. Clay? Well, I think it's some nervous laughter. I think it's, uh, uh, you, you either laugh or you cry. Oh boy, that guy comes up with great answers, doesn't he? <laughs> Thank you, Clay. <laughs> We'll jump now to uh, the uh, construction of the George Washington Memorial Bridge be, uh, just about to be completed. The final girders are about to be uh, set into place. And before they finished, they, they ushered out all of the tall masted ships. Here's the Monongahela, a four-master built in Glasgow in 1880, being tugged out in 1931, the year before uh, our Aurora Bridge was was finished off. The Monongahela uh, had 
uh, robed the ocean for uh, nearly five decades. It ended up uh, being sold off to a Vancouver logging company as a as a barge, and within four years was scuttled and, and disappeared. But look at those four masts. How gorgeous is that? What's happening in the scuttling? Uh, I think it finally just rotted out, and they said, we've had enough. So we're going to jump now to our modern image of this the completed so, bridge. I want to interrupt here. This is a good example of uh, Gene's uh, brilliance in making the book also a testimony of the contemporary Seattle. So the <laughs> images that he chose of the 1800 of the 1800, a lot of them have the opportunity to do the kind of thing you see in this picture, which is showing uh, a di the, the variations, the diversity of our cityscape and of our, uh, like the waterfront and the, and the landmark bridge and the, and the neighborhood and the, and the fleet. Uh, there, it's a wonderful testimony to Seattle. So the bo this book, which you'll want to buy extra copies so that your, your uh, family in um, Peoria, Illinois can have a copy too. Uh, this book is a wonderful a representation of the contemporary city. Well, and that my confession here is that I was trying to find something to replace the Monongahela, and <laughs> there it is. There you go. They the the mass was high enough. They did have to raise the Fremont Bridge for it, but that was that was the best I can do over over a period of several days. Oh, gee, that really hurts. I know. Sometimes <laughs> you just have to be satisfied with the clouds. Yeah. Those clouds I'll be satisfied with. Well, the, you remember the Yukon. We just left it behind, and one of the miners, uh, in fact, the fellow who discovered gold in the Yukon was George Carhart. And this is uh, a, a telegraph key that he created out of uh, the gold, that, nuggets of gold that, he, that came from his claim, mounted on Alaskan marble, and he gave it to President Taft in 1909. And Taft used it to open the Alaskan Yukon Pacific uh, Festival, our, our first World's Fair. And, uh, and it was used again to open the George Washington Memorial Bridge on February 22nd, 1932. Now, the... That's Wallingford <coughs> in the distance. Yes. And Fremont on the left. So Fremont on the left and Wallingford on the right. And those two uh, neighbors, generally peaceful, can get in fights over what's what regarding the ambiguities of what neighborhood is at the north end of the bridge. But here they all are in, in some unanimity. And the story behind this particular opening was that uh, on this day, uh, a longtime opponent of the bridge uh, named Roland Hartley, our governor at the time, who was, who was an Everett, a, a born in Everett and raised in Everett, was deeply opposed to all the interstate programs and, and, and uh, uh, any sort of thing that reeked of communism or collectivism. And so he didn't like a highway system, and he, he had invaded against the, uh, the, the Aurora, uh, Aurora Highway 99 for, and was certainly opposed to the bridge itself. But when, when he saw the crowds, he, he, he began to speak and bloviate for quite some time, taking credit for the bridge. <laughs> and uh, at 2.57 in the afternoon, uh, he had been speaking at such length, he, he, he lost track of time, and Herbert Hoover had his finger poised on the Taft key. And at 2.57, according to schedule, Hoover pressed the, the key, sending the signal to all the fireboats down below to send their plumes and, and the flags to be unfurled and the crowds cheering streamed out from both ends, Wallingford, Fremont, Queen Anne, leaving Hartley forever unfinished. <laughs> he never completed his speech, uh, but the crowds were delighted. And so here they are cheering and, and, and happy because yet another another strand of connection was established. That's not how you see the contemporary. No. You had, you had to rearrange your position. I did. 
the previous photo was taken from the hillside, which was not then covered with trees. And so another chore that I have to accomplish is to find ways to repeat photographs without the vantage that was available to the to the old photographer in that. And so I found I found a 21 foot long extension pole, which I actually use today to take a shot down by the viaduct. And uh, it, it's been very helpful because when there are trees in the way or when there are structures that no longer exist, I can get my camera up 21 feet in the air to, to come close. If not perfectly, at least I can make a gesture in the direction of up. Now, did you, did you uh, feel happy in this particular uh, snapshot you took here, photo, uh, by the bus more or by the, uh, uh, the big truck? The, the big truck? <laughs> I was delighted to get them both at the same time. This, this Sometimes I have to go back to spots over and over again, and to get something that looked reasonably crowded took me maybe three three hour-long attempts to just... You were here three hours? Well, like an hour at a time. How much did we pay you? Oh, <laughs> lots, Paul. <laughs> uh, buy books, buy yeah, books. Here is Herbert Hoover. At that minute, 2.57, pressing the Taft key, to do what we just described, interrupting uh, the bloviating Hartley. Now that key was used one more time, uh, a, a number of times uh, across the nation. It, we had a special relationship with its use, uh, and uh, John F. Kennedy used it to inaugurate the our second World's Fair in 1962. And it is now... Uh, sitting in the shuttered Smithsonian, but someday will be available to, to be visited again. And here's a little portrait from the book, and this is from a column we did about uh, five or six years ago, uh, featuring young Paula Dahl, who was the nine millionth visitor to the Seattle World's Fair. And you can see her with her proud parents hovering above and the wonderful, enormous dog that was, she was given as a VIP, and the nine million sign, and her very unhappy sister. <laughs> right there behind. And here... Wait, somebody asked a question. A question about her family? Well, well I was wrong. I thought I heard somebody asking a question. Here she is with uh, not her extended family, but her class, she's an Issaquah Elementary School teacher, and on the wall of her class, there's the nine millionth sign. So she came out on the front of the school and we did a portrait of Paula with her students. And Paul mentioned the fire from 1889, and here is one of the handful of photos that was taken of the fire burning. Uh, and we he posits in his original column that uh, uh, many of the photographers were no doubt evacuating their equipment and their and their photographs from their downtown studios. And if you look up here, you can see we're looking down from the corner of now what is now First and Spring, and there's one sole figure closest to the fire up on top of the Fry Opera House. That's which, the last photographer. That's the last photographer. <laughs> and everything in the foreground was burned up along with 30 blocks in downtown Seattle, and nobody died. No, that's right, except the rats. Were you sniffing the air? Were you smelling for smoke? I thought I smelled the smoke. Mm, boy, that's sensitivity for That you. is historical sensitivity. <laughs> Here we are today at First and Spring. Uh, all of those wooden buildings were rapidly replaced with stone and brick and mortar. Very good, Gene. So, uh, shot a couple days after the fire. Uh, we have the firemen looking down. And this is a will be a familiar location, so just note this particular front uh, portion of what you will recognize very shortly uh, as, a, uh, as a section of Seattle history. And here, here it is today, and it's not the Pioneer Building, which was built after the fire. It is 
that the front of what we often what do we call, call let's let them figure out. Well, yeah. What do we call that building? The sinking ship. Can you say it out loud? Sinking ship. Sinking ship. Very good. So we go forward now, and we can see this. The the uh, the original structure was the front of the Occidental Hotel, which after the fire was replaced on the same footprint by the the lovely and and glorious Seattle Hotel, and here it is in 1908 festooned uh, in in celebratory uh, flags and bunting, uh, and. Uh, uh, and today we look at it and we can see that same location is replaced by the sinking ship garage. Well, the sinking ship has been subject to many, many uh, vilifications over the years, but Paul has one defense which he'd like to share with you now. I do? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, I remember now. Uh, actually, the architects who designed the sinking ship garage tried to do what they could to make it sympathize with the ornate uh, Romanesque neighborhood that was built up in Pioneer Square following the Great Fire. Now, can you see the sinking ship garage at the middle, right, right down the middle? And then on the right, you can see the basket handle shaped uh, windows or fenestration in the uh, Merchant's uh, Cafe uh, building there at the end of First Avenue. Can you see the similarity? <laughs> How about it? Those that can read, see the similarity, raise your hands. <laughs> Nobody sees it? No, they do. I pointed it out. They, you pointed it out. Well, as you were saying, that? because you kept saying, well, we're, look, we can't. Look. Oh, okay. I'm sorry he spoiled your opportunity to brag and show off. He had to show off for you. Okay. You know, we've done this 25 shows now, and every time Paul always attacks me for showing what he's doing, illustrating what he's saying. I, don't, I just don't think I'm worthy of that. I'm not going to give you a sympathetic description of my own motivation. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. So that's, there is, that's one silver lining, I guess you could call it, to the old sinking ship. <laughs> there is one other, and that is that it's the loss of the Seattle Hotel inspired uh, a particular citizen of our fair city, Victor Steinbrook and thousands of Seattle residents to join in a preservationist movement to save the Pike Place Market. Because in the late 60s, there was a pretty powerful movement to tear it all down and replace it with garages and condos and businesses. Uh, and uh, here it is near its opening in 1907. And here it is today. What a loss that would have been. I just thought of something. Let's ask our mayor what his position was on that in the in the late 60s. And was he old enough then? I was to have about 13. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is Seattle's iconic place. It would have, yeah. we would never have uh, lived down yeah. in that yeah. Okay, you're, 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 we'll, we'll mark you in the in the right in column. the plus column. <laughs> <laughs> right, thank you very much. Very I good. actually, in my uh, den at home, have the original N from the Pike Place Market sign. Wow. You might say Pike Place Market doesn't have an N in it. <laughs> the, the sign actually says Public Market Center. Yeah. Uh, uh, we might be asking for that back. I'm a member of the Pike Place Market. <laughs> What's that? About to fight you for it? Okay, that's right. We won't fight. Let's move on, Gene. Let's uh, get away from this pugnaciousness. Okay. <laughs> so here we are. This is a, uh, an image of Seattle taken uh, at a significant moment in our history when the city once, uh, one of its great previous alterations is uh, just before that is recorded here. Do we have any takers? Anyone want to guess? Where? What are we looking at right here? The first one to get it right gets this hat. <laughs> or has the right to turn it down. Yeah. <laughs> free ad. What are we looking at? What year? I-5. I-5. Where are you? Raise your hand. 
Here's your hat if you want. It. Here we go. Be ready. Now. Good. Good show. I didn't mean to hurt you. Okay. You are correct. This is taken in the mid late fifties by Werner Lengenhager, uh, and he wandered the city. He lived not far, only a couple blocks from Melrose Place, and here it is, looking south towards the city. And in the book, we show both of, both his shots looking down that muddy stretch of alley, looking north towards, uh, well, looking north and looking south. Uh, by the way, I would wash the hat. <laughs> Very good. What's your name? Murray. Murray, you're not letting us know your last name. <laughs> Murray Wynn. I live about a block down that way. Oh, Murray Wynn lives nearby. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, what's next, Gene? Well, here we are at uh, a location which existed from uh, the early part of the 20th century to about 1958, when it was torn down. And if you were a Seattleite in 19 in the early part of our century, you would say, "Meet me at the steps." And those steps were, the, were made of chuckanut sandstone. This is the corner of 3rd and Union, where we now have, and had at this point, a federal building uh, and a post office. And here it is. Those lovely columns and the steps are, are chuckanut stone. And they had um, the, uh, uh, they were particularly porous. And so by 19, the late 1950s, uh, there was a, a movement to tear the thing down and replace it with something that would not be so stained with pigeon poop. <laughs> so we got rid of those steps and we replaced them with today's filing cabinet. Uh -huh. And we don't, I, there's not a lot of meetings that happen here. Uh, yes, Paul? Well, we should get another slide, but this is the one you used in the book. Right? Yeah, this is in the book. Well, it's worse <coughs> if you go back to the actual building that they built to replace the uh, Beaux Arts classic structure that they tore down. But it, it, it's, it's uh, considerably worse than this. Go ahead. You can take my word for that, or you can contest it. Well, I'm not going to say a word. So here we are looking down at Hooverville, about 250 of the 500 shacks lining uh, in, the, in what is now Port of Seattle land. And you can see Smith Tower up there hovering in the distance. I bet there's some people here tonight who remember Hooverville. Is that true? Possible? Anybody here who remembers Hooverville? No, no, only one Sky River attendee. I think they're from all out of town. All these <laughs> okay, that's all right. So I went back, and actually the Port of Seattle gave me a lift. And, and uh, in place of the B.F. Goodrich building, which used to stand at this spot, uh, I, I was allowed up in a, in a lift and retook that shot looking up in about the same location. And there's Smith Tower. And How many visits did this take on your part? You know, I only had one, but we spent about an hour up on the lift waiting for waiting for a couple of trucks to pass by. Around or, oh, no, you wait Just the, the trucks, trucks, yeah. I wonder if anybody can rec recognize that. Anybody here can tell us where we're at here? Yeah. Huh? Not Queen Anne. Nearby. Well, Fremont. That's it. It's Fremont, yeah. And you can see this is the Finney Trolley. This is uh, 1940, and it's about the same time that uh, all of the uh, uh, rail cars downtown were had already been removed. The trolleys, yeah. All the trolleys were gone and replaced by buses and uh, trackless trolleys. Uh, there were still a handful left up north, and one of them ran from uh, Fremont up to Finney Ridge, and uh, its motorman took uh, a photo of it on the corner of 34th and Fremont Avenue. And we had to find something, and uh, within a year, uh, this trolley too was uh, disappeared. And we had to find a photo at this, this corner. This took, uh, I want to say interrupt. Yeah. This took Gene a, a long time to figure out how to, how to repeat this, you know, by being true to the position 
and also true to the, the vitality. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the last trolley is replaced. <laughs> and I, I, we just say it's at least a couple women walking abreast. <laughs> and there's, uh, as in the old photo, you can just see it past the trees, the Fremont Baptist up, up on the hill there. Mm. <coughs> Quick drop down to Chinatown, the uh, um, Go Hing Festival, which lasted for several days in 1921. Uh, to repeat this shot, uh, I went back and enlisted the help of the Seattle Kung Fu Club and its founder and current uh, operator uh, and teacher, uh, Sifu John Liang, and he brought his entire school out onto the street, and we were right in front of the Hotel Milwaukee once again, and we took this early last year. We, we were assured, I was worried about taking over King for about 10, 15 minutes, and it turns out this guy is one of your own, a West Seattle cop, and he said, no problem. <laughs> but I just, here's uh, John Leong, who is 80 years old last year. So he's still an active Kung Fu teacher, and it's kind of remarkable to see him teaching in his own club. And he, he was one of the teachers of Bruce Lee in the 60s. He's not hobbling on a cane, although he's the same age I am. It doesn't seem fair. Thank you. <laughs> Here we are down in, uh, well, where, where would this be? Let's take some, let's hazard some guesses here. Duwamish, Duwamish, Duwamish is close, yes. Uh, it's, it's south of Lake Washington. Black River. Black River. Where is, who came up with that? This fellow raised your hand. Do you want a hat? There's <laughs> <laughs> a hat going begging over here. You might be able to share it on days off. <laughs> or season, seasonal. Seasonal, yeah. Talk it over with him. He seemed like a generous guy. This is the Black River, and this is a uh, 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 this is an attempt by the canoeists to travel down the Black River from Washington, Lake Washington, to the Sound. And it was the outlet uh, from fresh to salt that was natural. And uh, it's, it's about 1906, and within a few years, uh, Lake Washington was lowered. And uh, today, this spot is pretty close to <laughs> Rainier Avenue South. This is Carl from the Brown Bear Car Wash. Uh, just uh, about a mile from my birthplace of Renton. I'm not a native Seattleite. I was, I confess now, born in Renton General Hospital. Uh, and so Carl is, is, is my compatriot, and, and we both find solace from the black bears. This is the brown children who uh, Paul put on the cover of his very first Seattle Now and Then book. It's very, very good to me, these kids. I sold uh, thousands of copies of that first one. Even as we tonight shall go a long step towards getting thousands of copies of this book sold. <laughs> and all that, that book was much the less compared to this book. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't in color. And, and, the, and the actual printing job, while okay, wasn't so, so marvelously near to perfect as this one is, you really should buy more <laughs> copies for your relatives. <laughs> That's true. You, you, you know, over your 80 years, Paul, you are, you are one of the best shills. Hucksters. Hucksters, yeah. You're huckster of history. So we went back there today, and this is, uh, uh, and I took a couple of my neighbor kids, and this was for the Mohai show, the very first image. This is uh, Tia and Liana Owen. Uh, and the, the... How long ago? This is 2011. The pavement is the result of uh, paving over great sections of, of uh, what was once Lake Union and uh, extending that pavement far out into the lake. And Paul is now going to call your attention yeah, to this. Yeah, what do you think that's, that trestle is there? What did that become? You know on the water there? What did that become? Huh? 
the sea how you can get it out. This is the, the southeast corner of the lake. So what would that trestle be? It's a major uh, arterial, right? So this is Capitol Hill up here. Southeast corner. Could that be East Lake Paul? I know you're, you, you're good. He, isn't that, he sacrificed himself. Isn't that wonderful? No, it's West Lake, Dean, and you knew it. That's West Lake. So that's all cemented in and built up into a, you know, part of the new um, combined Allen and, uh, and what's the name of that company? Amazon? Amazon, those yep. two people. <laughs> so I went back in two th from 2011, I thought, well, we need a picture of the girls today. This is our one, uh, my one nod towards sentiment. And so here they are in the same spot just last year. This is Tia and Liana, and Tia terrifyingly drives. Have you driven with her? I know, but I see her leave the neighborhood every morning, and it's, she goes to Roosevelt. Well, let's all say it together. <laughs> this is the Kalakala in the locks. And it's a wonderful excursion in 1948 uh, with its decks filled with, it looks like happy participants here. They're, they're making a trip from Lake Union through the locks and out to the sound. And we don't know this event specifically, but I, I want you to pay close attention to the to the wheelhouse up at the top and those wonderful little round windows which were not very practical. And now Clay, who is how many of you rode on the Kalakala? Do we have any Kalakala riders? Well now Clay is going to do an impression of the Kalakala. Uh, I need your mic. Okay, go ahead. Well those of you who rode on the Kalakala know it made a lot of noise, right? Um, I got to ride on it when I was 16 years old, and it was the last month of its run in the summer of 67, riding over to Bremerton for the Olympic College Stage Band Festival as part of my high school band. And I was really struck by the fact that you couldn't go to the upper floors, you know, all spider webs and cordoned off, and on the main floor, once the ferry started running, the noise was deafening. It would go... <laughs> Thank you, Clay. Let's get Clay. That's my big moment of fame. <laughs> yeah. So I had to, again, go back to the locks and find a, something that would stand in for the Kalakala. And I, so I called up the locks and, and talked to the lock master, and, and uh, he said, well, there is a boat coming through in about a month. And it was in February of 2017, and it turns out hmm. it was the USS Turner Joy, which is a Bremerton Museum ship. And only after taking this photo did I discover that the Turner Joy itself had played a significant uh, role in American history. It was one of the two ships uh, in the Gulf of Tonkin, uh, along with the USS Maddox. And the Maddox was, uh, there were two incidents. The first one, the Maddox was in, engaged uh, some North Vietnamese gunboats. And uh, the uh, uh, U.S., the Turner Joy came, came to join it. And then there was a second incident, which most likely did not occur. But upon that second incident, the uh, Gulf of Tonkin Resolution was enacted. And so the... That was the uh, effective beginning of our major involvement in the Vietnam War. Uh, and you can visit the Turner Joy. It had been undergoing restoration and repair uh, and repainting in Lake Union for a month or so and was being towed back to, to the Sound and back to its birth in Bremerton. And here it is off the coast of Vietnam. Decommissioned in 1982. And I called your attention to the, the wheelhouse, and, and here it is, not far from us today. And Clay actually went back down to Salty's. And if you are keen to visit what remains of the Kalakala, this is it. It's that wheelhouse. And I guess it was 
uh, you know, for all of its life, this was not a very efficient wheelhouse, and Paul will tell you why. Well, I do, and I remember very well uh, this, uh, when it was explained to me by a captain, that in order to uh, navigate this vessel, you had to actually communicate with shouts out the wheelhouse to a navigator on the on the top. What's it called, the top? The deck. The deck, very good. Yeah. And then that deck navigator would send a signal to someone who had actually made the changes in the direction and all that. So you couldn't really change the directions of the Kalafala without two other people being involved with it. So there was limited, this is, this is like when you, 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 you pay for the cheap seats and it says well, there's a limited view. Yeah, you're paying for the expensive seats because that was to give the Kalakala this, uh, well, let's face it, sexy profile, this uh, <laughs> modern profile, Art Deco profile, that uh, it lost its capacity to be easily navigated. Well, here it is, Clay went inside and looked back toward the skyline. <laughs> And I'm sure this was a view that the, the captain saw on occasion. What's PSM stand for? I don't know. Please say <laughs> me. Please say me. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> so here's another <coughs> story of loss as we come in towards the end of our, our program here. This is a photo taken just before the April 4th opening of the viaduct in 1953. And uh, we will just jump right forward to, uh, and I actually hope to get on it on February 2nd and 3rd and retake this photo and a series of others that were taken on this uh, on the walker. same day. As a walker, yeah, uh, walking up and down. All day, February 2nd. You all can go. Well, and you, and you, you, have, you have to get tickets online. <laughs> you get tickets, and they've sold and, uh, out. Oh, really? They well, have sold out. But it's free. It's free, but they've sold out. So, I, I well, don't know how to explain that. I've got two tickets. I'll, I'll, rant, I'll raffle one of them for you. I've got three and I can't go, so. Oh. Yeah, well, you can. You've got three? Three tickets and, and you can't go. Oh, you want to hand them over now? Well, they're not here. Yeah, we could have auctioned We could have auctioned those off. Yeah, okay. Well, here we go, and I, and I went back, and this was uh, about a year, year and a half ago. And... Uh, the, I'm very proud of finding the red car. Yes. You know. <laughs> and there's the Smith Tower. Now, one of the big changes in the skyline... Wait a second, were you driving the red car? No, no, I wasn't. I wasn't. I was uh, poking out of my son's sunroof. Now, this is, this is a building that Paul and Clay and I and a number of people have, have really come to enjoy. It was called the F5 building, or it is called the F5 building. It was called the Mark. And the inspiration for it is quite unique. Let's look at it from below. And I it's took a new this, building. It's a new building. This was just being finished in 2017. You can see the top is almost done. I went back a few weeks ago and took this shot. And here it is. It's kind of lovely. It has this lightning streak going up the, the side. And there's the Methodist uh, dome, which was not destroyed to, to build it. So in a funny way, it kind of frames it. And I... I, I like the, the reflections. I, I really appreciate it and the kind of the off-kilter aspects of it. But there's a reason for this. And there's a reason it looks the way it does. And I'm going to go now to the reason, which is Audrey Hepburn. The developer, well, the developer was a huge fan of Hepburn and wanted to create a building. What was his name? Eric? Eric Johnson? Eric? Do you know, do you know who this is? Greg? He was uh, Kevin Daniels. Kevin Daniels, that's right. So Kevin Daniels was a big fan of, of uh, Audrey Hepburn, and particularly Audrey Hepburn in Breakfast at Tiffany's. So look at the cant of her hips and her shoulders, and particularly the line of her, of her cigarette holder. And this photo was in the lobby of the, uh, of the building as the workers were completing it. He also, his, his inspiration was to save... Methodist to save the Methodist, yeah, which was another kind of oh, fine... secular and sacred. That's right. And Hepburn looking over the Methodists. That's right. The Belgian-born Hepburn. 
<laughs> so in honor of this... Oh, oh, are any singers in the audience here? What's the great song from Breakfast at Tiffany's? You guys all know this. Yes, what is it? What is it? Oh, she can sing. You can sing, can't you? I can sing it. Come here. Come on down. I'm too shy. No, no, no. We'll all sing with you. We'll all sing with you. In fact, take a look here. Let's look. I'm going to even give you the first words here. Oh, look. It's actually one of my favorite songs. Oh, you better start then. I don't, I don't need the lyrics, but I will not grace you with my terrible Okay, give us the first note. Give us the first note. Moon River. You are breaker wherever you're going. I'm going your way. Two drifters off to see the world. There's such a lot of world to see. your name? Diana. Diana, thank you. No problem. All right. We had problems up here, but you didn't. Uh, all right. Wait, wait a second. I know there was a question. You were asking what Huckleberry Friend Oh, what does Huckleberry Friend refer to, guys? Anybody have a, no a notion of what that means? The Mississippi Yeah, that's right. what the uh, allu Huck and Jim. allusion to the two friends, you know? Two Huckleberry drifters. Friend, two drifters. You have your finger up to say something? Oh, you're just adjusting your shirt. Okay, now we're going to just close in on, well, where are we here? This is Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda. And today, looking down at this marvelous Ashel Curtis photo with the, oh, there it is. What is this, Paul? The microphone, James. The no, I, uh, a picture on the in the photo. Oh, there. Okay. In the photo, here we go. Here we go. The the structure on the waterfront. Yeah, that's where the bands would play, and the photograph was taken from the roof of the new. Uh, what do you call those things? The Alki Natatorium. Natatorium. Yeah, the Alki Natatorium, which was about 19, 1913. I think right about then. Yeah. So what happened? Why don't you guys have an auditorium anymore? Wouldn't it be wonderful to go down on the waterfront and dance? Just on a summer's day. I feel like it myself. Well, but John Leon would join us. Yeah. Okay. And there we are about that same curve. It's a lovely shot, Gene. Thank you. Oh, well, let's jump up on the hill, and we actually... You might recognize uh, the fellow standing behind the No to the Wrecking Ball uh, stick. Are there? I think there's several people that could, might be recognized in this photo. This is 1989, isn't it, Clay? Yep. Can you come here for a second? Why don't you come and talk about this? Who, is, who are these people? Well, they're in the audience tonight. Well, let's point them out. Have them stand up. They already have. Greg and Sharon Nichols. <laughs> Greg and Sharon, thank you for coming. To this back in, this is exactly, almost exactly 30 years ago. Uh, next week it would be January 29th, wow. 1989. And notice the perfect movie on the marquee if you're protesting the closure of a theater. We organized this in about three days, we being the Historical Society. And uh, this, uh, the, the uh, signs were painted by somebody some of you know, Mo Bierman, who did this on his own. He was a professional sign painter. And we had all four TV stations out covering it. Cairo did it live. 
It was a big, big media event, but we knew nothing about landmarking. But we got knowledgeable very quickly, and within six months, the City Landmarks Board landmarked this building because of the groundswell. We sold 1,300 Save the Admiral buttons. This is before the internet. We, we got 4,000 petition signatures. We packed meetings, and, and that meant that this building will never be torn down, which paved the way for the recent restoration of the movie theater, which Gene will eventually get to. I'm curious what the other movie was. It was the Naked Gun 2. <laughs> this is opening night at the Admiral Theater in 1942. Mm. Carmen Miranda, remember Chiquita Banana? Well, Carmen Miranda was the model for that. Uh, weekend in Havana is the opening night theater, and look at the crowds outside. Sometimes there are lines outside now. It makes me cry every time I see it. Um, Greg, what do you remember about that night? Well, uh, the not not oh, 42, but <laughs> no, 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 I, I get that. Uh, the young man in the front is our son Jake, who uh, recently became a dad. Uh, on the right is Georgette Valley, uh, who represented our area for a long time in the legislature. Who's that leader on the left? And on the left is uh, is my sweetie, uh, Sharon Nichols. Uh, it was there was a we're just a few blocks from that theater here, but we live nearby as well, and there was a real sense of loss. That theater defines our neighborhood, I think, um, to a great extent. It gives us a, a more active evening, uh, people on the sidewalk and going to restaurants and the like, as well as uh, moving. And uh, there was a real sense of loss, and the Clay U, uh, in particular, uh, helped us to avoid that loss and today have uh, have the legacy of that, so thank you. Well, you're welcome, and it's a whole community effort. It takes a village, and uh, the city points to this as the uh, model for a community landmark movement. In fact, when you landmark a building, you can do it without an owner's consent, which we needed to do with Cineplex Odeon in this case. Gene, are we moving to the next? We are, so finally we're going to move to uh, something, another thing that Clay organized, and I think you were you were there as well, Greg. So let's take a look at this. <laughs> this is what we called the group hug for the Admiral Theater. This is in the book. Uh, this was uh, about two and a half years ago. This was when, yeah, Gene's pointing to the podium where we had not only former Mayor Greg Nichols, but former Mayor Norm Rice speak, as well as several other uh, speakers. And these are kids from, you can see on the marquee, we kind of lined it up that way. These are kids from Lafayette, Schmitz Park, and Alki Elementary Schools, all of whom walked to this. And we, this is one of several group hugs we did in order to uh, just celebrate the, the landmarks in our community and to get kids to do it. Because every one of these kids in here, when they see this photo online or in a poster at a street fair or wherever, they come rushing up to it. I've seen it. They come rushing up to it and they say, the, that's me. <laughs> and that means that's me and my community. And that is community pride. That is uh, really uh, affection for the landmarks in our community. And it ties them viscerally to it. And so this was one of the more successful ones we did. And guess how this photo was taken? Up on a lift truck by none other than... Yeah, I was there, and as was Brad. We were standing side by side, and I think Brad has the video of this of this event as well. So that was a, a fun day. Uh, as we go forward, we're almost done. Well, I'm guessing that most of you recognize this structure. It is the oldest building. I bet they don't. Well, let's find out. Let's see. How many, don't tell us what it is yet, but let's do a show of hands. How many know this oldest structure in Seattle? That's not fair. You've just given it away. Did I give it away? Only five people raised their hands. Well, How did I give it away? Well, I guess you didn't. I didn't. <laughs> well, it's, it's right here. It's down at the end of Alki, and it's moved, been moved now from its, the location here off of uh, Al Alki Way. 
uh, and back uh, along uh, 64th, is that it, Clay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. About a block back. This was a photo. This was a photo given to uh, loan to Paul by a prominent Seattle resident whose uh, family are standing on the porch and sprinkled around the Anybody outside of the, the house. Family is Haglund's. Who? Haglund's. Haglund. Yeah. You're very good. That's right. Except it's a little older than Haglund. That's what he is. So this is uh, his um, wife. Uh, his mother. Her mother, rather. Thank you. Uh, her parents. That was the Hansons and the. Ivor's mom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Grandma. Granddad in the black coat. Who's the guy on the far right, Gene? Uh, he's Snidely Whiplash Hagelin. <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, young Snidely's son peeing on the corner of the house. <laughs> no, I, can, I can understand that necessity sometimes. Yeah. Okay, so that house is still there. I mean, there's one of the wings is gone now, which we'll sort of see in Gene's repeat. We will, and just to go back a little bit further before the Hansons, uh, to whom the house was sold, it was built by uh, Doc Maynard when he moved from uh, Pioneer Square to West Seattle and picked up his, traded his acreage in Pioneer Square for 320 in West Seattle and started a farm with his wife Catherine. And this, their first version of this place uh, burned down and they replaced it with this one. And then in the late 60s, uh, it was sold to the Hanson family. And this is taken probably in the, in the 90s. Uh, and today, it still exists. And here's the members of Southwest Seattle Historical Society and Clay standing on location. Uh, the current owners have trimmed back that bush and actually improved the front and made it quite quite lovely and not quite so scruffy. So it has never received landmark status. Though we find we think of it as a as a as a prominent uh, uh, example of of <coughs> Seattle architecture and and history. And it's the oldest structure in Seattle. So nothing older. Made of wood. We're now coming to the last couple slides here. Uh, Catherine Maynard was uh, the second wife of Doc, uh, gave uh, Kiki Soblu, the daughter of Chief Seattle, her pioneer nickname, which was Princess Angeline. And Princess Angeline lived in a, uh, a little uh, house below Western, below what is now Pike Place Market. And uh, Paul and Ron Edge, who's been working on the column for many years, uh, along as a as a as a helper, and a, he volunteers at Mohai and and feeds us some marvelous photos uh, that he scans and sends Paul's way. And Ron and Paul went down and and triangulating stumps and building cornices and roof lines, found the spot where this little shack uh, existed. And I went back there with Ron, and we were both uh, delighted to find it was open air. And here's Ron sitting on the porch. This is uh, just north of the uh, Pike Street uh, steps, and it's between the Pike Place parking garage on the left here and the Fix Medor building on the right. And this is a little corridor that runs all the way up a little green belt that runs one of the tiny handful that run all the way up from Western, or from the waterfront up to Western. And so Ron is peering out now at the waterfront, just as Princess Angeline did in that spot. And you don't have access to it today. Um, it's fenced off. But you can see it if you go to the Pike Place Market and go eat at Lowell's Restaurant, go up to the second floor, look out the window, and it's right below you. Can you recommend what to order at Lowell's? <laughs> uh, I'd say the view. <laughs> or as we say, seafood. <laughs> now, that is the cleverest thing tonight. That was it right there. Let's give an applause to those guys. That was completely <laughs> So our final image, our final then of the, of the evening is Kiki Soblu sitting 
in uh, what is now the market on, uh, on Pike, and uh, now Post Alley, and it used to go considerably further down the hill uh, towards Western, but this is uh, in the early 1890s, uh, near the end of her life. Uh, we inset a photograph of a uh, studio portrait of Chief Seattle, uh, her father. Uh, the, uh, we have them both together here. First Avenue runs behind her. Uh, she has her back turned to Front Street or First Avenue. And uh, we had a kind of a special effect for our next photo, which we're pretty proud of. And it, one of them, one of the fellows here is, you, you might know, this is Ken Workman, who grew up in West Seattle, who is the great, 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 great grandson of Chief Seattle through his second wife. And there is uh, Mary Lou Slaughter, who's the great, 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 great granddaughter of oh, okay. Kiki Soblu. And ah. they, as we found pretty close to the same spot and retook this portrait. And uh, take a look at Mary Lou. She was a, uh, she's a magnificent uh, cedar worker and basket maker, but she made these gorgeous cedar shawls and, and cloaks. Is she also 80? She is 80 years old, another 80 year old. And is, and... So, uh, so hard to compete. <laughs> <laughs> and what a beauty. So there they are. And as we were taking this photo, uh, it took us uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes, and there was a little crowd passing by, and Clay took a shot of me taking their picture. And Ken, uh, at one point, Ken turned around a couple times and, and sort of glanced around himself and, and, and motioned for me to, to, to finish up because, and I said, what was that all about, Ken, Ken later? And he said, well, I, th I thought there was someone trying to get through because someone kept tapping me on the elbow. And so Clay and I were both taking this picture and, and we said, well, we, we would have warned you if, 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 if you were in anyone's way, but we didn't see anybody. So I think of this, uh, Ken has a very specific interpretation of who was tapping him on the elbow, and I, th I think of this uh, as the, a, a little nudge from history. And uh, so... Yeah, you're doing that very well. Though. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Paul often uh, shows a little bit of skepticism here, but we're, we're going to give Ken his... Anyway, so Ken has, has uh, often showed up at, uh, at a number of our shows, and... Uh, has been a, a participant in this, in in uh, in the book and in the celebration, and uh, both Mary Lou and Ken were were enormously grateful to because I think this is a special, uh, Gene, a special photo. Y yeah. Isn't this an example of something kicking in sometimes when you're out there shooting? Yeah, it, and so occasionally uh, when when I'm repeating a photo, I will find a little, um, I'll find myself. Uh, in that same location, with my eyes standing in the same spot, or, or focused on the same from the same position as the photographer who originally took the photo, and there's a satisfied. It's like when a Rubik's cube, that last little portion of a Rubik's cube, kind of falls into place, and I. That's my nudge of history. I can feel that little chunk as everything drops into place. You can do the Rubik's cube. I never could. I never could. But if I if I could, I that's I'm sure what it would feel like. That's the closest I've ever gotten to doing a Rubik's cube. Anybody do the Rubik's cube here? Well, we've got lots of mathematicians here. And that's it. Here's the cover of our book with Paul, a photo taken by Berenger Lamont, our French friend, in 2011, uh, standing up on Kite Hill atop Gasworks Park, looking over. His fair city. So, and thank you very much for coming tonight. And uh, we'll be if you'd like a copy of the book, the book is forty nine ninety five plus five dollars sales tax. So it's basically fifty five dollars. You can come pay me, and then take your book to Paul. He will personally inscribe it for you, as will Gene. However you wish. So give us a minute to set up here and we'll be ready for you.